afternoon, good morning, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Good Stock Being Good is a State of Mind Conference. We are thrilled you decided to take part in this virtual event with us. You're here alongside volunteers, advocates, activists, policymakers, and educators from all over the world. We are all here today to share, discuss, showcase, and learn from our collective experiences on how to grow the good and expand the circles of good in the world. This unique conference is part of the events that mark this year's Good Deeds Day celebrations, organized by Ruach Tova, that is part of the Arison Group. It's hard to imagine that it's been 15 years since the first Good Deeds Day took place. What began as a small seed aiming to inspire good deeds has grown and blossomed into a global movement involving millions of people in more than 100 countries worldwide. With us here today is the woman who started it all. She's the driving force behind today's conference and the Global Good Deeds Day movement businesswoman and philanthropist Sherry Arison. Hi, how are Hi, you? Hi, I'm great. This is so exciting. It, it really is. Well, I think uh, we should start in the beginning. Okay. How did this idea come to be? And did you believe it would grow internationally? Because what happens today is so amazing. And I see the pictures. It's unbelievable. 15 years. Yes. Well, actually, I'd say about 16 years ago, oh. I was in uh, my morning exercises in the sand dunes here in Israel. I live in Tel Aviv. And um, I'm always trying to figure out what I can do to make the world a better place. And I've always done this through business, through philanthropy, mm -hmm. through spirituality, and uh, always trying to come up with new ideas. And during this morning exercise, I, it was like a light bulb went off. And I thought, there's so much good in the world, but everybody puts the focus on all the negativity. Um, the media, Venture. people are always talking about what's wrong in the world and what's negative. And at that point in time, I said, you know what? There's so many good people. There's so many good organizations that do really good work. Let's start highlighting that and talking about that and putting the focus on that and create a day that's all about doing good. And that's how it started. I came to the office, talked to Good Spirit, which is one of our organizations, and they said, okay, we'll, uh, we'll start this day. And it started small and started growing and growing until we see millions of people in 108 countries wow. doing good deeds. That's amazing. And I need yeah. to exercise more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, personally, I have to say, I look at the conference ahead, and I, and I must say, I'm, I'm just, I'm so touched. That's how I feel. We have a remarkable list of people who are bringing good into the world. But at the same time, we live in a very, very cynical world, world I would say, especially here in Israel. How do you deal with all that? Well, like I said, I think if we put the focus on what's good in the world, and there is a lot of good in the world, we just need to put more focus on it. Um, that's what's going to grow. I mean, where you put your intention, that's what grows. And um, look, it started off very, very small. In Israel, right before the corona started, we had two and a half million people wow. signing up to do a good deed because everyone can do it according to their heart's desire. It went out to 108 countries. So it's really very simple. It's where you put your attention. I, I have to ask, um, after a year like that, you mentioned COVID, obviously. Right. We're, we're still there, unfortunately. How do you focus on the good when there's so much, so many hurdles on the way? Look, I think, you know, and, and this is why we're having the conference, okay, because a, a lot of people are still in lockdowns. Mm -hmm. um, people are going through rough times. But I think it gives a lot of light and a lot of hope uh, for people to see that there is a lot of good in the world. And doing it virtually, we can reach so many people and connect people and unite people and really change the the change what's being talked about. And that's why we're talking about going from shaming to faming. Instead of shaming mm -hmm. people, say something good about people. Um, so it's the small things. It's, it's just really it. acts of kindness. I love it. Yeah. Faming. Yes. I don't know if it's going to work on the news, but I'm going to try it. I promise. Okay. okay. <laughs> I'm going to start a movement of faming instead of shaming. Right. Right. What do you think the world needs um, good deeds day? 
Um, like I said, what, what we need is to put the focus on good. And, and what we need to understand is that by doing that, we, we, bridge, we bridge people. I mean, Good Deeds Day has really crossed all walks of lives, different ethnic groups, different cultures, um, children, elderly, um, youth. I mean, all of this has been connected because each one can do a good deed according to their heart's desire. So for one person, it can be going out and cleaning beaches, and mm -hmm. another person, it can be uh, taking care of the elderly or doing something for children or um, people who have disabilities. I mean, each one can do something according to their heart's desire. You know, we see all the videos, and it's just, it's so amazing that people do all these things and I'm sure it, it doesn't end up in one day, because after you do it once, you want to do it again. Well, first of all, we see that most everybody who connects on Good Deeds Day mm -hmm. ends up volunteering all year round. Wow, that's uh, amazing. We have an or organization, Good Spirit, which really connects volunteering with organizations that need volunteers. So it does continue all year, all year round. This only highlights what's being done all year round. But can one day really make a difference? we see that it's made a difference. First of all, if you look back 15 years ago, you didn't see people talking about the good things. Not in the media, hmm. um, not in, you know, in, in Facebook book or, or any of the other uh, social media. You didn't see it. Today, the circles of good has grown. So yes, it has made a difference. You can see that there's good news, you can see that people are, are starting organizations around doing good. People are talking about doing good. And you know, when I say think good, speak good, and do good, it's not a slogan. It's something that we need to do every day to look at how we think, how we speak, and, and how we act. That, that's amazing. It's a, I think that's yeah. the way to live. Yes. That's what makes you happy. Yeah. But um, what, what do you think, what do you consider to be good deeds days biggest achievement so far? Um, I think the unity, the fact mm. that it unites everyone. Because, for instance, you know, here in Israel I've gone, we have all the different municipalities involved, we have businesses involved, the educational system, uh, the army, everybody's involved in Good Deeds Day. And no matter where you are in the country or what your background is, everyone is connected. And I think that's the big achievement, is that it unites people around the idea of doing good. I think at some point, maybe after COVID, it will unite people all around the world when we can travel again and uh, do good deeds also other well, places. this conference, Goodstock, is uniting people from all over oh, the world. Sure. Everybody's taking part, and so we have people from all over the world, from the United States, from South America, from Europe, from here in Israel. I mean, really, people are uniting around the idea, so um, definitely, yeah. Every year you go out with the volunteers into the field, working with them and meeting those in need of some good deed. Could you maybe share some of your experiences uh, through the years? Wow, there's so many. Mm -hmm. um, I really like to go see um, a large spectrum of projects. So every year I try to uh, see projects in Israel and also around the world. This year, unfortunately, I can't uh, go out to see projects outside of Israel. But within Israel, um, once I was in a neighborhood in Jerusalem where um, it was a very rundown neighborhood, mm -hmm. and all the neighbors came out with volunteers to clean the neighborhood, to paint the buildings, to plant gardens. Um, and they just did a huge transformation wow. to the whole neighborhood, which was amazing. Um, another thing that was touching to me was um, an Arabic village um, that I came to and that they said they never participate in things like that and they would continue and it really has grown to all the Arabic municipalities. And what really touched me was in one of the Arabic neighborhoods, um, I went to a school and they were reading um, one of my books, um, A Day of Good Deeds for mm. Children in Arabic. So that to me was amazing that it's because reached so far. It's, it's amazing. I remember picking up um, oranges yeah. during a, <laughs> yeah. one of yeah. these days and I, and I loved it. I really enjoyed yeah. it. Um, and it feels like every, every deed, every good deed, has the ripple effect. Yes. And I think that's, that's what makes it so, so special. It affects the neighbors, the community. 
the society. Well, you know, like on Good Deeds Day, when an organization goes out uh, or a group of people and they go to um, an elderly home or to um, whatever the case may be, wherever it is that they're volunteering, a lot of times they'll adopt that specific organization mm. for the whole year and they'll continue and they'll they'll come and bring products and, and help the, the area. So yes, it does have a ripple effect because it's not only the fact that it's growing, um, but the fact that people tend to do more. So, yeah. That's just so wonderful. Um, so looking ahead, how do you imagine Good Deeds Day, let's say, a decade from now? Well, it's funny. I always say to my group at the, at the Arison Group that in the future, I hope we won't need Good, Deed, Good Deeds Day. And they get like really nervous. What do you mean we won't <laughs> need Good Deeds Day? Um, but that's really my hope, is that it'll just become mainstream, that people will really start to be good people and a mm. good society um, and that this will rub off to more and more people so that we don't need to set that kind of example. So we just live that way. That's my deepest hope and dream. Yeah. I wish this would. You know what? I, I really like this day. So maybe <laughs> let's give it a little bit more time. I'm sure it'll continue. I'm sure it'll continue for many, many years. Yes. But let's hope more and more people get involved and more and more people make a difference so that the world will be a better place Amen to live in. to that. Yeah. How are you planning to expand the circles of doing good in the world even more? Um, look, we, we're constantly getting to more and more countries and within each country to more and more people. Mm -hmm. um, so we just hope to reach more and more people with this idea and that people take part and become our partners. We have lots of partners all over the world and we invite everyone to become partners for Good Deeds Day. Sherry, I wanna thank you for being so open and sharing your thoughts and work with us. But b before we conclude, I'm a journalist after all. Yes. Uh, I need to get the scoop first. That's it, it's me and you here, I need to get the scoop. Uh, tell us, what's next? What's your next big project for spreading the good in the world? Um, well, I can tell you I've, I've come up with, I, I wrote seven books. Mm -hmm. And um, I give you a teaser, another book is on its way. Oh, so that's. I got my scoop. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> Sherry Harrison, thank you so much. <laughs> thank thank you. you for doing good things and uh, making us, us all want to do good things. And hopefully everyone will join. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. They say very big journey starts with one small step, and the same can be said about doing good. Sometimes a small act of honesty and kindness can inspire great actions and trigger others to do good. But how do we create such a ripple? How do we create a lasting impact? To discuss further, I'm joined in the studio by Orly Wahaba, the founder of LifeVest, a nonprofit dedicated to inspiring, empowering, and educating people of all backgrounds to lead a life of kindness. Hi. So great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you me. so much for being here. From Denver, Colorado, Gary Dixon, president of the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation, a foundation focused on the belief that all people can connect through kindness and that kindness can be taught. And from Vancouver, Canada, Jacqueline Wei, founder of 365 Give, a charitable organization dedicated to educating, empowering, and inspiring children to change the world. Thank you all for being here. Um, I have to say, you are truly inspiring people, and I'm so glad that I get the opportunity to interview you. So since, since this is our first panel for the conference, I would like to start with each one of you to share a little bit about yourselves and your work before we dive into our conversations. Let's start with you, Orly. Well, thank you so much. So I'm from Brooklyn, New York, but I, I actually recently moved. I got that with accent. You got that with accent. You can't miss that. That's for certain. <laughs> and I just moved about a year ago here. I actually had a background in teaching. I was a middle school teacher for seven incredible years. And the concepts of kindness, compassion, empathy, these were concepts I was implementing into my classroom on a daily basis. And about 10 years ago, my students actually inspired me and encouraged me to take that leap of faith. Mm -hmm. And I left my job teaching. It was supposed to be just for a year to pursue a dream I had in my heart ever since I was a little four-year-old kid that dreamed of changing the world. 
I mean, it wasn't a dream per se to start a nonprofit. At the age of four, you dreamt about changing the world. Four, That's amazing. This has been like the one constant in my life. I, my family used to make fun of me. I used to sing the song Heal the World you know, by Michael Jackson. Oh. They're like, oh yeah, Orly, <laughs> this is so sweet. you're gonna heal the world, sure. <laughs> and so I decided to, to, to leave my job, uh, take that leap of faith, start the organization. And it started with a short film that I did called Kindness Boomerang, showing an act of kindness going from one person to mm -hmm. the next to the next, and then coming back to the person that set it into motion, showing that it's the simple things that we do that truly make a difference. And that film just went crazy viral, reached well over 100 million people globally, wow. and started what I've come to call the kindness revolution. So it's been an exciting journey uh, working on Life Vest Inside and empowering people to recognize that their greatest strength, their life vest, exists within them. Uh, and at, at, at our essence, we're really focused on empowering people to recognize that. And we do that through inspirational media, through education, mm -hmm. through international events and leadership training programs, and through technology. That is just so wonderful. Thank you, Oli. Um, and Jacqueline? Good morning, everybody. Hi. Just an honor to be here. And uh, this is just a gift just to stand with both of these two um, to talk about the work that we do. And, you know, our, I think our journeys are all very similar. Mine a little bit different. Um, that it was really parenthood that inspired me to start 365 Give. Um, and it was inspired by my uh, little boy. Uh, his name is Nick. And I had a really simple mission uh, when I became a parent, and that was to grow kind, compassionate, loving, mm. um, happy little human beings. And I knew that um, giving and kindness can be taught and compassion. Uh, so on my son's third birthday, we started a little journey that we were gonna do one thing to give back to the world every day for 365 days. Uh, and Who's next we set to you? ourselves on a journey to give every day. <laughs> And it was an incredible journey. Uh, we did. A, I ended up doing a blog around it because mm -hmm. when we started, that's kind of what you did. I was not a uh, social media guru or anything else. But what we realized is that giving is so simple. Even a three-year-old can do it. And um, who's next to you? I so just sorry. Up. I just love dogs. I have to see who's next <laughs> to you. You know what? I apologize. I apologize. No, please don't. We we all love dogs. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> anyways, she's, she's distracting me a little bit. I apologize. Uh, no, but our, no, she's our adding, she's adding. Day journey was so amazing um, because what we really learned is that giving is so simple. Even mm -hmm. a three-year-old can do it. Our, our simple analogy is it's, it's like brushing your teeth. It becomes a daily habit that once you get started on it, um, it just becomes who you are. It becomes part of your daily routine, you look for ways to give and they find you. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, for those of you that believe in the law of attraction, when you open your eyes and look around your world, there are so many simple ways that you can give back. Um, we make it so easy for children that we talk about giving back to people or giving back to the planet or to animals. It's, it's not just people, but it's mm -hmm. the ways that you connect to the world around you. Um, we, we were so blessed in our journey. Um, I always say we got the calling and we ended up turning 365 Give into an educational program for teachers and really a tool for teachers um, that you can start implementing a daily giving practice right into your classroom um, as part of your curriculum. Uh, and I got very blessed that I was asked to do a, a TEDx talk. We called it How to Be Happy Every Day. It will change the world because we know how much um, giving brings you happiness and brings other happiness. Uh, and I think to date, we've had over 5 million people that we have been able to inspire through our work and our TED Talk. And it's these two right in front of me today. They have been part of that journey for me. They don't know it, but the inspiration wow. uh, to keep going because all the work that we do, none of us are in this for the money. We do this because we believe that every single person that we can inspire will create that ripple with everybody that they touch. And so I, I'm just really, I'm honored to be with, with both of you uh, and your journeys and with Goodstock because all of us that are doing this keep touching different people in the world. And that's the ripple effect that, that keeps it spreading and keeps it going so that we can all retire, Gary. I just said this one day, maybe we can all retire uh, because the world <laughs> is that happy, kind, compassionate place that we want it to be. Wow, amen to that. And Gary, hi in Denver. Yes, good morning from the from the mountains. <laughs> good afternoon, wherever it is. Good afternoon, uh, well, good morning, good evening, little, everything. We're all around yes. the world here. 
Well, uh, as Jacqueline said, uh, it is an honor to be with Orly and Jacqueline. Uh, truly uh, great people in their fields, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here. Uh, my journey is uh, probably a, a little different still. Uh, came through the communications world, working in advertising, this kind of thing. And, um, and then came to uh, the Random Acts of Kindness Foundation. And uh, I remember a, a student in Michigan said to me, you mean kindness has an address? And uh, he <laughs> saw my business card. And uh, I said, yes, it does. It does. I said, uh, actually, the address is, is everywhere. Everywhere people are, are kind. And wow. um, so we started with schools. Uh, that was our beginning. Uh, could kindness be taught? Uh, does it need to be taught? And uh, it turns out that it's, uh, it's a reminder more than anything. Um, so we began in schools, and pretty soon we had uh, 500 schools a, a week, and then 1,000, and then about, uh, I think we're now getting about 3,000 downloads of lesson plans uh, from about 70 countries. It's all free at randomactsofkindness.org. And, uh, and that was a wonderful thing. Our chairman has allowed it to be free. Uh, so that's a, that's a nice thing. Um, and uh, it really comes from uh, uh, the belief that people are basically good and could use a, a little reminder, a little lesson, uh, uh, something to encourage them. And so we, we grew into the workplace, mm -hmm. and and now we're uh, we've just developed programs for the home, uh, because uh, in a day that's where we typically are. We're at work, we're at home, we're at school, somewhere uh, uh, in those places. So we hope that uh, uh, being a part of Good Stock um, is another uh, opportunity to share what we're doing and to learn. Uh, uh, I was most excited about this to learn from Orly and, and Jacqueline and, and the other speakers you have. My goodness, what a mm -hmm. what a, uh, a long list of great people you have available for us to hear. And there is a video that you want to share with us, right, Gary? Yes. So let's watch yes, it. Yes, we'd love to. We have two foundations. One mm -hmm. of them is uh, Random Acts of Kindness and the other is the uh, uh, Foundation for a Better Life. And uh, so we created a a uh, television public service announcement uh, around kindness and uh, let's take a look at it now you know there's a light that glows by the front door don't forget the keys under the mat when childhood stars shine always stay humble and kind don't expect a free ride from no one don't hold a grudge or a chip, and here's why. Bitterness keeps you from flying. Always stay humble and kind. Hold the door, say please, say thank you. Don't steal, don't cheat, don't lie. I know you got mountains to climb, but I love it, Gary. Oh. It's really, really great. So you all have a really small, tiny goal to change the world, <laughs> but you guys, you actually managed to do it. So I want to ask you, um, how do you make people want to be kind, Orly? So the truth is, I, I think that it all actually starts with ourselves. Uh, for me, it's all about empowering people to recognize how much they matter, how unique and significant they are that we're each, in a sense, a piece of a puzzle. You know, different shapes, different colors, but every single piece is the same size. If we can come to truly love ourselves and embrace ourselves, even with our flaws, even with our mistakes, that means that we can embrace others for who they are, even if they think differently than us, if they believe differently than us. So my belief is that the way to get to a kinder world is simply to empower people to recognize just how awesome they are. And that's, how, that's what I think creates that ripple effect. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you, Jacqueline, I want to ask you the same questions, but you know, the workplace, uh, school, even kindergarten, as I see from my uh, five-year-old daughter, it can be very cruel. Um, 
not very kind. How do, how do you teach kindness? Is this, is this a thing that you can teach? Absolutely. You know, children and research has actually shown us, most people don't realize there's been so much scientific research done on kindness and giving uh, in the world. And we are actually born to give and to be kind. We, mm -hmm. we have it built in our DNA. I've become a bit of a neuroscience uh, nerd around this um, because our bodies and brains are actually built for this. Uh, and so we can actually, you know, children have been shown that they're, they're built for it. It's actually um, changed as they grow in our world. They, mm -hmm. they see in the outside world that things are not always so nice. So when we bring it back to the children and we teach it in the classroom, we teach it in our families, um, they will actually just remember uh, within themselves that this is something that is innate in each of us. We actually call it your daily dose of happiness because you get this amazing chemical and body and brain reaction um, that sparked to make you feel happy. So when we mm -hmm. show children that through kindness and giving, not only are they making others happy, but they feel that happiness inside of them, it encourages them, it encourages them more and more um, to go out and, and be giving and kind in their own lives because they feel so good when they do it. And, mm -hmm. and we're seeing that more, you know, the, the COVID has brought so much um, anxiety and stress and depression to our children. And this is actually a tool for parents right now and for schools that they can use to help literally reduce the stress and anxiety in children and increase their well-being and happiness. Hmm. Gary, where does the impulse to act for the benefit of others begin? What attracts people to follow us? I think that it's, uh, it's really the love we have for the human family. We're all in this together. I think this COVID uh, pandemic has, has shown that. Uh, we're, we're, none of us are alone. And congratulations to Israel for leading the way, by the way, <laughs> you know, being, uh, being a leader internationally in this area. But I think it is a love we have for the human family. And, uh, and again, as, uh, as I said before, a, a belief that people are, are basically good. Um, I remember a quote from the Dalai Lama. He said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. Hmm. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And, and so, you know, there it is. You know, kindness, uh, as Aurelia was saying, comes from within. Um, if you want to help yourself, help someone else. And, and I think that, that feeling good, you know, that we feel good about it and, and the person we're being kind to feels good and it begins to spread. But Gary, at the same time, I agree with you that uh, COVID-19 has taught us how we're all one big happy family. But at the same time, I feel that we see a rise in, um, in racism and in anti-Semitism. Uh, even I can tell you here in Israel, um, many, many, um, I would say, even talks about how uh, people who are against vaccines are bad or people who are for vaccines are, are evil. How do we overcome that? You know, it's, it's a great question. Um, I think we are in a very divisive time, but mm -hmm. uh, speaking of vaccines, I think kindness is that vaccine for divisiveness. Uh, it really is. Uh, we, uh, we have to do it. Uh, it begins with ourselves being kind, uh, you know, holding a door, saying please, saying thank you, um, and then it spreads. Um, you know, um, when, uh, when you're coming out of a, a game or a concert or something and you just can't get into traffic and someone lets you in, um, you see something happen, uh, very likely that person will also let someone in. And it just begins that way. You know, you're, you'll never know uh, the end of the ripple, so to speak, when you're uh, kind to someone, especially someone that... Uh, this isn't expecting it, you know, mm. they, you hold the door for someone and, and they look at you like, wow, uh, thank you. And, and pretty soon they're doing something for someone else. And, and so it goes. Uh, and, and so that, that's the only way it's going to happen. And I really do believe that uh, it is true that uh, the vaccine, so to speak, for divisiveness that you're talking about mm -hmm. is just being a little kinder and to start somewhere to start at home 
to start at school, to start at work. You know, it's funny you mentioned uh, holding doors because I just realized yesterday that no one holds the door for the other one anymore. No one wants to touch the handles, just like trying to <laughs> push it with the elbow. Uh, but Orly, I wanted to ask yeah. you, how does one take responsibility for propelling goodness forward? I think that, again, like I said, it really does begin with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that it also has to do with being able to create meaningful dialogue. I feel like that's something that we've lost in this world. Being able to have dialogue. Dialogue means that there's two people that potentially have two completely opposing views. I, I know that over the years, over the past several years, there's been a shift that we tend to shy away from connecting with somebody that may have different ideologies or thoughts than us. It just we click a button and we just unfriend them as opposed to hearing people out because we're not meant to be the same. Mm -hmm. We all have a different fingerprint for a reason because each person is here in this world to bring something into the world that nobody else can bring. I could do whatever I might be able to do in my life, but I'm never gonna be able to do what Gary could do or Jacqueline can do or you can do because we all have our specific purpose. But if we can create dialogue with one another, be able to hear people out and be okay with the fact that maybe we have different approaches to the same issue, and, and that's okay. Uh, and I think that that's coming to accept ourselves, to really embrace ourselves and to love us for who we are. Uh, but again, I also believe that kindness is something, it's a muscle. You know, we all go to the gym and we exercise, we wanna get stronger, mm -hmm. but we forget a very important muscle, and that's the eye muscle. The eye muscle, we have to work it out to start seeing the opportunities that surround us. Now I know, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you should be an ostrich and put your head in the sand. I know that there's negativity going on in the world, but there is also so much good. There's so many incredible people, but if we only are going to see what maybe media shows us, the negativity, then our eyes are only gonna start seeing negativity. Mm -hmm. But if we can train our eyes, if we can exercise that eye muscle to start seeing the good in people, my goodness, how many great things we're gonna see around the world. But in what way do you mean seeing the good in every person you meet? I believe that there is good in every single person because look, there are bad actions. I don't think that there are bad people. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to be able, if you can see, if you can help to see the good in someone, you can help them begin to see it in themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's really where a shift happens. Uh, and I think that that's, that's, a, that's a key component. And Jacqueline, um if I want to start this beautiful ripple effect of love and kindness, where do I start? You know what? We always say you just start with one because mm -hmm. every time you touch one person one day, that's how it, how it ripples. And we can all do that now. I mean, we think of even social media and how that affects um, the people in our own circles that we can touch, whether you have... 10 people that you influence within your social circles, or you have a million people, every time you post, like Orly said, you know, you share the good, you, you smile. If you can't open a door, you can smile as you're going out. You can hmm. say good afternoon or good morning. It's the simple things we can do every day. And for those of us that aren't in full lockdown, you can still buy a coffee for somebody behind you. You can still feed a homeless person. There are the things that we can all do every day, if 7 billion people on this planet did one small thing to give back, to be kind in our world every day, that's the way we change it. That's so what we it have it. really does start with us, just one give, one day, one act of kindness, and that's how it ripples out. Um, you know, it's, it's how we started. I think it's how all of us started in our own ways, that we had that belief that it can just start with one, and that it can spread. And I can tell you, if I can do it with my three-year-old, anybody can do it. <laughs> you know, I think it might be easier with your three-year-old uh, because I can tell you uh, that when I'm happy, I'm very, very kind. <laughs> but when, when I'm not so happy, mm. well, it depends. Gary, what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I, I remember a story as you asked that question, how do you propel this forward? Um, Mother Teresa had been asked the question, you know, uh, with all of the poverty around you, with the, the kind of the endless cases that, that, that come in front of you, um, how, do you uh, how do you keep going? And what do you recommend for the world? And she said, uh, do the thing in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what a, I've never forgotten that. 
do the thing in front of you, you know, because we're always like, well, I must travel over here. I must go on a trip and, and do some good. She said, just go home and look around, as Jacqueline has said, uh, uh, just start with one and, um, and do the thing in front of you. And I, and I think uh, it's, it's good to remember, too, that kindness is an action word. You know, you can't sit in a chair and be kind. Uh, you have to get up and do something. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that's important. You know, we might uh, say, well, uh, I need to be kind. Well, you, you have to show that. You have to do that. And when you do, good things happen immediately. Um, and Orly, I want to ask you, how can each of us strengthen this chain of good to make it last for a very long time? That's a great question. And I mean, again, just speaking about what, what they're saying is, you know, starting with something simple. What I would say is uh, my, my best advice would be, you know, I think we need to take something from this past year of COVID. Here we were, we're locked at home. Mm -hmm. Okay, we couldn't go do the things, the busy work that we're generally, you know, make ourselves busy with going out or traveling. We were stuck at home for a very important reason, because I believe in my heart that real change, kindness really begins at home. It mm -hmm. really does, you know. Although kindness is an action word, like Gary said, I don't believe you do kindness. I believe that you live kindness. Kindness can't be something that you just schedule in your day. It's not like, yeah, I'm kind on Mondays and Fridays, you know, from three to four. <laughs> you miss me, make an appointment next week. It doesn't work that way. It's not like, okay, I, I'm kind today, check. It's the way that you live. It's the way that you see the world. But it begins with the way you see yourself. And during this time of COVID, when we were home, really, the greatest kindness we could do was for the people right there mm -hmm. that we sometimes don't see. Sometimes it's easier to say, okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to, you know, visit a soup kitchen or I'm going to visit an old age home. And I'm not putting those things down. They're fantastic. But often the greatest thing that we could do is for the person right next to us. And if we can simply focus on that, on our inner circle and our world in our home, and we can strengthen that, that's going to then be able to shine out into all other areas of our life. But taking it, like, one, like we said, one thing at a time and recognize that sometimes you're going to do the kind thing, you're going to do the good thing. Sometimes you're not necessarily going to see the goodness come right back at you. It's not like the film, you know, we, yes, we do have cameras in a sense above our head or we do have things, sh you know, showing where we're going. But again, we don't sometimes see that ripple hitting back to us. Mm -hmm. But make no mistake, when you put something good out into the world, when you put that positive energy out into the world, it will create tremendous ripples. Uh, I think, again, it, it has to do with us recognizing our power and recognizing that kindness is a choice. And it's something we get to choose every single day. It's a choice. We could choose to mm -hmm. see people or we could choose to walk on by. It's not either you're born with it or not. You choose to do it. You choose you it every second. It's a choice that we make. And the choices that we make don't only dictate the lives that we lead. They dictate the lives of those who mm -hmm. choose to follow us. Um, and our last question I want to ask all of you, we are asking here today from everyone to spread more good around the world. Maybe you can share a few examples with our viewers, show them we can all do something to help. Jacqueline. Oh, that's, you know, uh, there's so many powerful stories probably that we can, we can all reference in so many ways. You know, we are very much like you. Um, and it's always the, the beauty that I see is when people come together in the large groups. Um, at 365 Give, we have our annual event as well called Do One Give Day. Um, and, and those are the days where when you see the power of, of people coming together and that's mm -hmm. in the schools and it's on social media, you know, that's when you start to connect the dots and so much about what Orly's talking about as well. You know, if we could see the big cosmic planet and you can see those dots that are continually being connected through the good that we put out in the world, that's the magic. And so for me, when we see, you know, Good Deeds Day, we see Random Acts of Kindness Week, um, you know, and we, we see the Do One Give Days of the world, and there's many of them, which is the amazing part, is that's when we see the power and the uniting of people coming together because we actually all want to see the good in the world. We want to create the good in the world. Mm -hmm. And those are the stories that when we talk about an energetic shift, you literally 
for me, I can feel it in my body. You can feel it all around the planet. Um, and, and it's the power that makes the difference to all of us all over the world. And it doesn't matter what circles you touch, whether it's random acts of kindness and the, the people that you touch, whether it's do one give day, it's good deeds day, it's dance for kindness, which is Orly's, you know, all of those keep creating that big, powerful impact. And it's showing everybody that we can unite in giving and kindness to make that difference in the world. Those are the ones that touch me the most. Thank you. And Gary? Well, I'm inspired just listening to those. Huh. You know, I think if we determine to leave people a little better than we found them, um, you know, which is a challenging thing sometimes, but uh, I think about that, you know, if I've got a, a difficult situation, I think, you know, how, how can I interact here and leave this person better than I found them? And, and I think uh, it's the simple things. They're always the big things, you know, uh, uh, to write a note of appreciation. Uh, sometimes uh, just a simple note on a, on a post-it note, uh, hey, thank you, or great job, uh, will change someone's day. You know, um, smile at someone. Uh, I heard Lady Gaga say, kindness is very simple, and the good news is it's free most <laughs> of the time. <laughs> I guess you could buy coffee for someone. That may cost a little bit, but, but largely kindness uh, is free. Uh, it has health benefits, too. It, uh, it reduces the stress hormones in our body. It, uh, it makes us feel better. Um, I think, uh, I think too, you know, uh, a piece of advice someone gave me, they said, uh, Gary, you're going to be the same person five years from now, except for the people you meet, uh, the places you go, uh, books you read, and the uh, service you uh, perform for other people. And I think that uh, that's true. That uh, That's where change comes from inside. Thank you. And Orly? So one actionable item I would say as a teacher, and I, I love teachers and I love being a teacher, I love my students, a really great action item that we all can do, it doesn't matter what age you are, if you're in school or you're not in school, is write a letter to a teacher that has left an impression on you, that's left an impact mm. on you. You have no idea how much they appreciate that. I have to tell you that my most valuable possession that I own, that my most valuable possession are these five books of letters that I've collected from students wow. over the course of the years. And it's these books that I go to, like on those days where, you know, I question my value or I question my worth. And we all do, by the way, we all do. Okay, no one is free of that. I turn to those books and I look at it and suddenly I recognize it. it teachers, I cannot tell you, nobody becomes a teacher if they don't love kids. And simply writing that letter to a teacher that's impacted you, that's left an impression on you, is, is a tremendous thing. I mean, there are loads of small acts. I have a whole book of 365 acts of kindness. I mean, there's so many things that we can do. Just the other month, we started doing these uh, monthly dance parties. And we all get together from all over the world leading up to our 10th <laughs> annual Dance for Kindness. And after this dance party, I took three acts of kindness. And what we did is, on Zoom together, with people from around the world, we gave everybody three minutes that we were engaging in each one of these. Mm -hmm. Simple things, like writing a positive review on you know, somebody's website or their social channel. Because oftentimes, we only go to write a review if something bad happened. And we rush, oh, it's terrible, so the service, it's, it's crazy. <laughs> but there's so many good things that we forget to do it. Very Takes true. less than three minutes to do something like that. So whether you do, you write a positive review, or you write a letter, to me, that's the greatest thing. If you guys could all do that, take that upon yourselves, my goodness, you don't know the impression that it'll have on a teacher of yours. What's your address? I need all of your addresses. I'm going to send you some letters. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Mine is orly at lifevestinside.com. <laughs> I will tell you. It's uh, the small Great. things that we do really do leave an impression. I remember writing a letter, mm -hmm. putting a book together for a teacher that was, uh, she was already retired, and she was very close to being on, you know, heading out, in a mm -hmm. sense. And I remember she said to me, she was crying when I brought it to her, filled with letters from different teachers and different students throughout the years. And she said to me, Orly, most people don't get to hear this unless they're you know, at their eulogy. She said, you gave me such a great opportunity. And when she passed, and she said to me, I, I want you to promise me that when I pass, you're going to read this letter at my funeral. Wow. I was crying hysterically when she said that. And at her memorial, I read that letter, and her ch kids were there, and they said, you're, you're the orderly that gave her that book? Do you know that any person that came into the house, every time they came, they said, look at this book. She said, look at this book, look at this book. Wow. That's the impression so of a simple letter on someone. 
Orly, thank you so much. Gary, Jacqueline, I have to say, you are, I think, the best ad for being kind because I see your passion and kindness and your, the sparkle in your eyes, and I just want to be like you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. When aiming to do good, we often put others first. When we focus on the change we want to see in the world, we might neglect our personal needs and well-being. To further discuss how to be kind to ourselves and positively influence others, I would like to turn to Ruach Tova CEO Ido Lotan, who will present these questions to two outstanding individuals. Ido. Hi. It is a pleasure for me to have this opportunity to speak with two inspiring individuals. I'm Idolotan, the CEO of Ruach Tova, and I'll try not to interrupt. So here with me is Ruti Rodner, founder of the content and consulting brand 25 Hours a Day, newspaper and television editor and screenwriter. And Owen Fitzpatrick, psychologist, speaker and author who has spoken in 30 countries and whose TEDx talk has been seen by more than a million people. In the next 20 minutes, we'll try to gather some insights about how we can better manage our time, be good to ourselves, and as a result, influence those around us. So, Wuti, you came from the media industry. What drove you to begin exploring time management? Um, actually, it was the very, very difficult junction between motherhood, I'm a mother to three, and, and career and my career as, as, as an executive in the media industry here in Israel. Um, I realized that I love those two jobs very much and that I want to do, to be at my best doing both my parenting and of course, uh, dealing with the contents and create creations, whatever I did there. And, and I realized that I have to have kind of baselines, a method to have this, things going, these things together going on. Uh, so I, I started to leave around, I don't know, almost the, my, my older daughter is, is 19 these days. So I started to leave by those uh, um, principles and rules uh, that enabled me to, to play those fields uh, quite intensively. And uh, I realized that I, I'm onto something. So it's all began from that. Hmm. See, so Owen, I, I want to jump right in. Um, how, how can you uh, change, how can one change their inner thoughts or mind? So I think one of the things that's important, Dido, is that you need to, first of all, become aware of the fact that you can. So often what we tend to do is we tend to live in stories inside our head. And so Ruthie will tell you as a, an incredible screenwriter that a lot of times, uh, the stories that we tell on screen are mirrors of the stories that we tell to ourselves about ourselves. And so a lot of people live as victims or as villains in their own mind. They see themselves as the perpetrator of their own misery or the victim of their own misery. And so one of the most important changes you need to make if you were to change your mind and to change the way you think and to change what you do is to be able to recognize that you're the hero of your own story, that you can turn things around. I think when, when Rudy made that shift and she now helped so many people with her incredible advice, one of the things that she knew at that moment was that despite how difficult it can be to be a working mother and to juggle as many things as she was juggling, she realized how powerful she could be and she realized that she could take charge and could take control. And so I think we all need to buy into that. We all need to realize the power we have to overcome the adversity we face and to me, a large part of that comes with starting to recognize that you do have control. You are the hero of your own story. And that's what I try to remind myself every day. And I think if everyone reminds themselves of that every day, that's the first place. That's the beginning place to be able to create real long-term change. I'll add to what Owen just said that uh, when I was a young mother, this uh, very popular book uh, published, I don't know how she does it, by Alison Pearson, it became a huge hit, but you know, uh, also uh, later produced as a film with uh, Sarah Jessica Parker. And I remember myself saying to myself, which is like this inner story, saying, uh, "You don't know how sh how you uh, you don't know how to do it. I'll show you how." 
So this is how kind of you design uh, your, your own story, your, your own life path, taking into your consideration also not on, on, uh, only wishes and, 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 and desires, also needs and, and obligations to other, but uh, it's, it's possible. You can do that. Yeah, so uh, Uti, um, how can people be thorough and mindful while also being efficient with their time management? It's, um, you know, I'm, I'm always speaking not about how to manage your time. Uh, for that, you have a diary uh, or all kinds of uh, apps. I'm speaking about how to manage your life over time. It's just like when you're organizing your closet, when this day, is, uh, with, when this day arrives and you say, okay, I have to, to bring everything out, everything uh, out. You don't really make any change in the closet itself. You change the, the content of your closet, right? You put the winter clothes up there, so we, the, you have the, the, the summer clothes more accessible. So this is the, the kind of mindset that I want people to go through their own lives, to, to, to take a look over its content of, uh, and, and to try to think what they really need to be accessible for them now and what they can put aside for a, for a while, uh, um, uh, just for, a, for an example. So, so uh, if you do this kind of organization your, uh, of your, your own life content, I think you can live a, a fuller life. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm calling my brand 25 hours a day, but actually I don't have this extra hour. I just made room for more time by organizing my, my life content a little better. I, I want to add to that because I, I love the concept that Ruti just brought up there about managing your life versus managing your time. So often we focus so much on time, but the reality is you can't manage it. It's going to go by no matter what you do. And I love the way that Ruti describes, you know, the, the closet metaphor, because I think what we need to do if we're truly to be better at being able to manage our life is we need to recognize that it's all down to the decisions that we make. And it's all about getting the clarity in our head to be able to do that. Years ago, I did a TV show which I, where I was traveling around the country. It was called Not Enough Hours. And I was traveling around the country helping people to manage their, inverted commas, time. But it really wasn't anything to do with the time because everybody is the same amount of hours. Even great geniuses of the past, like Einstein or Tesla, had 24 hours a day. And so 24 hours even itself is just an arbitrary number that was made many years ago to try to divide up the day into 60 minute increments. And even minutes are again, arbitrary uh, concepts that were created. So all of these things are pretty much man-made or women-made. The problem that we have is, is that we start to allow ourselves feel like we're overwhelmed and we don't have enough time. And this feeling of insufficiency, this feeling of not having enough, not having enough time, not having done enough work, not being loving enough, not being a good enough mom or a good enough dad. All of those are the problem. We need to be able to shift our mindset or attitude around time, as Ruthie said, so that we can start to manage our life, make better decisions. And I, I really do. I have to say, I love that. I love the reaction or response uh, that uh, Ruthie had to, I don't know how to do it, or I don't know how she does it because it's such an important concept, especially for many working parents out there who are really struggling. No matter how tough it is, there are ways to make it better. Not to make it perfect, but there are ways to make it better. I think that, uh, that uh, trying to make uh, things perfect is one of the, 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 the more, I, I see it as a hurt point of our time because I, I think that people are being exposed to other people's life through uh, social networks and it seems perfect there, you know? And what they don't realize that we don't put all the, 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 the pictures, all the photos uh, uh, out there. And actually uh, we don't see a full pictures of other people's life. So we are kind of chasing this perfection instead of realizing our, of our own imperfection which there is something not only liberating for ourselves, saying, okay, I can't be perfect about it, but also very liber liberating for others. To recognize your own imperfection is not only liberate yourself, but also give the others the freedom to feel that they don't have to be perfect themselves. 
and by running your life in so many areas, part of it is to see where you can excel, when you can be at your best, and when in order to keep things just done, it's okay to be just okay. Yeah, I love that. And I, I mean, I, I have a phrase where I, use, I like to say, like, dig deeper beneath the snapshot. Because let's say even in relationships, you know, you look on Instagram and there's these two people going, oh, I love you. I love you so much more. And they've like pictures of them smooching and it's like there. And, you know, let's say you've just had a fight with your partner. And let's say you're alone in the lockdown and you're looking at this going, everybody is so happy. Everybody's got the most amazing love life. Everybody, everybody's on vacation. Whenever you, whenever you go on Instagram, everyone's like taking photographs and everyone's having a great time. And it can be very easy to compare yourself, as you, uh, you mentioned, Rudy, to this perfect image of this idyllic life and then to feel inadequate as a response or in a result, as a result of that. And uh, it's so important to dig deeper beneath the snapshot to realize, you know, that couple that are like, I love you so much, I love you. They're probably tearing the hair out of each other uh, like five minutes ago. You know, they're probably screaming. Like that's no, like normal life is the ups and downs, the ebbs and the flows. And when we realize that we don't need to hold ourselves up to that kind of standard all the time, we get to embrace that concept that you mentioned, Ruby, about being vulnerable, about being okay with not being perfect, about being okay with the fact that you didn't do great today but you're gonna do better tomorrow. And I think that's the key strategy there is that we live in a world with constant reminders of what perfection should be. And it's good to inspire us to do better, of course, but not at the cost of us feeling continuously like not enough, not enough, not enough, right? So there you go. It just, uh, I, I, I call it the photos that don't <laughs> because you don't upload them, but they are there, you know? you. You, you, you show your kids so happy with their birthday present, but you don't uh, show them when they're tantruming on the floor, screaming that, that they, want it, uh, they want it something else, you know? Uh, not, not, so, not, yeah. to men, not to mention, whenever you take photographs of your children smiling, a lot of time it takes about re really about 20 photographs because they're like, they're looking in the wrong direction or they're crying or the blah, blah, blah. Eventually, after bribing them with all sorts of things, finally you get that smile and picture, and that's the one that goes online. And and that's what everybody else see, and I think that part of this self inspection, of this self awareness, that help people to realize uh, that maybe they they can do better ch uh, choices over their own lives, is to see those unselected photos as well. Of course, it's photos as a metaphor to all those uh, things that we try to keep in mind, and they're, they're not uh, giving us a full report of what what's life is about. Owen, oh, I want to ask you, how, how does changing one, one's mindset positively affect others? How, how we can... Well, I mean, th there's a few factors in that, um, you know. So first of all, um, whenever you change your attitude, whenever you change your emotional state, whenever you change the way you feel, there's a there's a process called emotional contagion, which basically means that states are contagious, emotional states are contagious. So if I feel excited, you're more likely to feel excited. That's why the best teachers that you ever had were so good, because when they got excited about a topic, you started to feel that way as well. Um, so your feelings affect other people in that way. But also your feelings dictate your thoughts. Your thoughts then will in turn affect your feelings, but also affect your behavior. And your behavior in turn is gonna impact other people. And so there's this old um, you know, idea um, where when you're totally certain about something, when you have this absolute belief and conviction in something, that can actually convince other people as well. And it's partly because of the way in which you feel, but it's also because the way in which you feel affects the way you articulate yourself. And so the more that you can change your mind, the more you can impact others, both through your emotions and through the way that you communicate with them, the way that you impact them on an everyday basis. Look, there's many of you right now listening that are doing a huge, uh, making a huge impact on so many people. And one of the things that uh, you'll know is that that's not always easy. It's not always easy to be able to, to deal with the challenges that you face on an everyday basis. And so you have to look at the resources you have. And just like, you know, in order for us to be able to survive and thrive, we need to be able to have, let's say, money in, a, in, a, in an organization. We also need to have the resources of the mind 
And that means your ability to be able to feel the way you need to feel when you need to feel it. It means your ability to be resourceful, to be able to be creative, to be able to be confident, to be able to be determined, to be able to be resilient, to be able to bounce back from adversity. Those are the kinds of resources that we need in order for us to survive and thrive as we move forward into the future. So I think once you change your mind, once you start to see yourself as the hero of your own story, you can then even transform into another character, again, that Ruthie would know a lot more about than me, but it's the mentor character. It's that person that when you see yourself as the person that's mentoring others, helping others, guiding others, bringing others forward, transforming other people into heroes. Because in many ways, the really doing good work is not just about you handling your own life. It's also about making such a positive difference to all those people by mentoring them, guiding them, helping them, supporting them, lifting them up and empowering them to be their own heroes. And so to me, that all starts with you. It's like when you're on a plane, you put your own seatbelt on uh, first, you make sure you put your own oxygen mask on first, because once you do, then you can help everybody around you. And so it all begins by seeing that you don't just have to be the hero, you can also be the mentor of your own story. Interesting. Wow, being on a plane. <laughs> this is a metaphor I, 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 I need to kind of bring up from my uh, <laughs> far memory. But, yeah. but yeah, I, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I listen and, and I agree and I embrace. And, uh, you know, I, I'm always saying to people, find out where you're at your best self. For me, it's when I'm with my children and I'm trying to, to, to kind of gasp, encapsulate what's about me now that is so, so good for me. And I'm trying to bring this, this goodness to the other arenas that I am active on. So I think it's kind of my own interpretation to what you've just said, Owen, about uh, kind of finding this uh, nuclear of goodness in yourself and project it uh, to wherever you can. And by being a, a parent, a friend, a coworker, of course, a manager, you touch so many lives and the lives you touch are touching so other many lives that uh, I really believe in this uh, very individual responsibility of just being good to yourself, to others, and, and have this uh, touch spread, um, you know, from person to person, to persons so, sometimes, of course. What do you, in your podcast, you, uh, you discuss everywhereness versus hereness. And I want to know how, how does mindfulness work yeah, work in a, in a multitasking context? I think that, um, that it's no surprise that uh, mindfulness as a kind of a Western culture or technique um, uh, deriving from, from Eastern philosophy and, uh, and practice, I think it, it's, it's not surprised that, that they came out when we were so flooded with a digital life uh, uh, enable, uh, enabling us to do so many things at one time. Uh, it has never been uh, like that for humanity that you can, you know, I, I can sit now and talk to you while I'm finishing my shopping online and texting my son to get out of his whatever and, uh, and, uh, and wandering through the, you know, the, the, those tabs on your laptop is like a very good metaphor of how our mind kind of running from one thing to another and uh, and by being digital and now from you know working from from home and and actually we hardly move out of our chair but we move everywhere through those tabs i think that we kind of lose uh, the, the 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 focus that we need and also we lose the ability to do one thing at a time properly. And in that sense, mindfulness, which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a licensed um, uh, teacher of that. I just follow that because I think it gives me kind of a contradiction 
to this everywhereness, to the fact that we can be uh, everywhere, allegedly, and actually by that, by that being kind of nowhere. I'd just like to add to that because I think um, I 100% agree with, uh, with the importance, as Ruthie mentioned, of, of uh, skill sets like mindfulness and the ability to start to focus your attention on one moment. A lot of the research out there in psychology suggests that multitasking is kind of a myth. It's not that we can't do it, we can, but as to Ruthie's point, we just don't do it nearly as well as we would if we focus the same amount of time on the task sequentially because our brains take a little bit of time to switch from one mode to another. And this is primarily with anything that is cognitive. In other words, anything that requires our brain to work. Like for example, if you're doing the ironing and you're learning a language, then you're pretty much gonna be okay or relatively good at that because you've got ironing, which is sort of an automatic behavioral uh, activity. And then you've got the um, learning a language, which is more of a cognitive activity where your brain is really using the resources. So that's not so bad because you're able to do both of those things simultaneously. But when you try to do, again, what Ruthie mentioned, when you're trying to go from tab to tab or, you know, this particular thing that you need to think about to this other thing, it does take your brain a little longer to be able to switch properly. And so you're not giving each piece of work the amount of effort or energy or time or attention that it requires in that moment. And so even though you think you're saving time, you're more than likely spending more time than you would when you deep dive or do some deep work into it. Um, and as Ruthie mentioned, mindfulness, focusing on the present, focusing on what you're doing, focusing on just that task there and going completely immersive in it is actually way more productive and way more likely to yield the kind of results that you want than you trying to do 16 things at the same time and try to juggle right all of them um, simultaneously. So it's a really good idea to recognize this whole idea that just because you can do many things at the same time doesn't mean you should or doesn't mean that it's even good for you or good for your ability to get those things done. Um, not to mention so important with your relationships. I mean, so many people, Adam Ruthie, I'm sure you could talk to this, is, uh, you know, when you're a parent or you know, let's say even a, a, on a date with your significant other, if you're out there with them, um, and you're, you, you know, you've got your phones out and the phones, you know, which can be great contraptions in many situations, but oftentimes they distract us and we're never fully present with other people. And also our attention spans as well. You know, if you don't get my attention in three seconds, well, best of luck, because that's what Facebook does. That's what Instagram does. So I think we really need to come back to the importance of why mindfulness is so important right now. And I think the concept is so important because we need to slow it down and we need to start to recognize when our children are there, we need to give them 100% of our attention. When our partner's there, we need to give them 100% of our attention. We need to cultivate the, the skills of patience um, and focus um, that necessarily are not as, as revered, especially in the sort of the, the world that we live in, in terms of uh, the way in which social media or the media works. So I think it's really important for us to focus on those kind of things. I, I have a, a small advice on that point. I, I just take my children out and we walk together. And by walking, this is, of course, the body really gain a very good sportive activity, but you can't really use your phone while walking. You, I mean, you can walk like that. So it really brings us, you know, if I'm, I'm going out with them, it really brings us together uh, just to stroll and to speak and some of the most wonderful deep conversation that we had, especially over this last year, which, you know, being out just a bit was really essential. Uh, it, it's amazing. So it just uh, this kind of thing, I mean, that you really can bring two things together, uh, walking and talking. And it's, it's amazing, in an amazing way, very simple, you know, everybody can allow it to himself, to, to herself, just to, to, to go with someone you like, with someone you need to have a good talk, and just to walk and talk, walk the talk, talk the walk. I just, um, we're, we have to, um, to, to conclude ourselves in the, uh, it was a very interesting talk. I just want to ask Owen if you, and, and of course, Uti, afterwards, if you could follow up on that, is what are the tips that you can give the, our audience uh, for staying motivated over time, not 
So what, what I'd say is, first of all, it's not just about staying motivated. It's also about staying disciplined. So motivation is when we feel like doing something. Discipline is when we do it regardless of how we feel, right? And so there's a few things. Number one, figure out what motivates you as is. So are you motivated by what you have to gain or what you have to lose? We're motivated towards what we do want or away from what we don't want. And some people are motivated away from what we don't want. So if they say, I have to do something, they're more likely to feel motivated. Other people, it's, I want to do something that motivates them. So figure out what works for you because not everyone is motivated by the same thing or in the same direction. The second thing is, is that whatever the task is that you're trying to motivate yourself to do, break it down into milestones. Make it so that you can see it in smaller chunks so you can see it easier. You know, if I have to write a 100,000 word book, um, that's a huge task. How do I stay motivated? I break it down into 2,000 words a week for 50 weeks. I break it down into 400 words a day for five days. And then I can say, oh, I can easily get 400 words done in a day. So when you break it down, you're able to motivate yourself in that way. Um, and that will help you move towards it. And then the third thing I'd suggest is give yourself rewards along the way. Stuff to look forward to, stuff that you reward yourself. Obviously, you don't reward yourself for exercise or for healthy living with like ice cream, right? So you pick your right rewards or the smart rewards. Vegan ice cream. A vegan ice cream, maybe. Yeah, for sure. Um, but you don't reward yourself with things that won't work, but you do reward yourself with, you know, things you do love to do. Uh, even, you know, your favorite TV show, for example. But you figure out whatever it is that you're motivated to do. And as a result of you doing it, you reward yourself. So again, it's figuring out what motivates you or motivated towards what you do want or away from what you don't want. It's breaking the task down into smaller chunks. It's figuring out how you can reward yourself. And then just to one point on the discipline, once you get into a habit of doing something, once you're motivated enough to start it, then put it into your schedule. Make it a no-brainer. Make it this. This is just the way it's going to work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to go for a workout every day at 7 a.m. That's the way it is. No question, no debate, no argument, no, oh, I don't feel like it. Lots of things we don't feel like doing, but they're good for us. So the key is because you're doing so much good for others, it's important, as Ruthie mentioned, to do good for yourself. And that means doing what you know will help you and doing what you know will be good for you. Okay, guys, unfortunately, we need to conclude here. <laughs> I wanted to thank you it's so just much. Just the beginning, having all those yeah, uh, thoughts right. now, uh, you know, Sorry. brought up. But we can continue, but uh, we have to conclude this uh, session. So I wanted to thank you so much for this insp inspiring conversation. And I hope uh, the rest of us will stay at the conference. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Ido, Ruti, and Owen for a wonderful and insightful conversation. Well, this is the end of our first plenary session, but we are only getting started. We have some fascinating conversations in our breakout sessions for you to seek out. So go explore the events platform on and we will meet back here in the studio for our next plenary and inspiring guests from around the world.